so what it, how how do you define neuroanthropology so the easy way to define it is 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 neuroanthropology sounds uh like what it is which is anthropology but with a modifier of neuro um so it's really a field-based discipline that draws on cognitive science broadly, neuroscience specifically, to tackle ethnographic problems and theoretical problems. Um, ethnographic problems are ones that emerge um, in our field work, and so that makes it different from lab-based research. And tackling ethnographic problems, both uh, Greg Downey and I have found that drawing on neuroscience um, has helped us understand things that came up during our research in ways that uh, anthropology didn't always illuminate, in my case, working on addiction. And then on the theoretical side, neuroanthropology is a way to try to negotiate um, how culture, mind, if you like that term, and brains come together um, and, and to do it in a, a less reductive way than um, is often done. So to try to you know, break mind-body dichotomies, uh, but also to recognize really that um, both neuroscience and anthropology have theoretical contributions to make. And we still have to sort of trace out what's in the middle um, in ways that uh, let us you know, understand human variation. Yeah. What, what does that look like on the ground? On the ground, it's I think the one of the things that makes it different um, from a lot of other interdisciplinary efforts is is you often start with um, ethnography to get a, a sense of how things work on the ground that 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 you have to get a sense of what variation actually exists rather than assuming you know it beforehand. Um, and so, if I use the the example of addiction uh, or drug use, most people sort of see it as a sort of constant state. And, but, uh, when you work with people, you recognize that they go through a phase where they use more, use less, um, that different types of problems come up, uh, even when they're using. And, and so for me, that that's the empirical reality that, that you try to then explain. Um, and that makes it challenging because you can't sometimes reduce the problem to, to something that's more manageable, but it's also the promise of it is to say, this is, this is how it looks. Um, and, and if you want your explanations to match up to that, then you pick a piece of it um, and focus on it. So in, in my case, one thing that happened in my research in Colombia, so they have a diff- just a different different definition of addiction than, than we do in the United States. Here in the United States, we often see it as a disease and something that emphasizes pleasure. And in Colombia, when they talk about addiction, they often classify it with other vices. Um, and then they see one of the primary things that goes wrong with using um, too much is that people want too much, right? They want more and more. Querer más y más. And, uh, and that matched up really well, actually, with a neuroscience theory that came out um, in the 1990s and then has been subsequently developed over decades that really emphasizes how, you know, we that reward isn't really about pleasure. It's about involvement and wanting. And and so there's this match between what, I, what was being reported to me in Colombia and what the neuroscience was saying. Um, but the neuroscience was based on rat models, uh, rat research. And so does this actually play out in people? And if so, what does it look like in ways that might be different from lab-based uh, studies? So in a, in a nutshell, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mixed methods approach. Um, and, and that can take various forms, but the ideal one would be trying to use mixed methods to, to bring the strengths of, of both, uh, both sides together. It sounds like in some ways you're kind of pulling back on some of the old, um, theories, I guess, and, and kind of the logic that a strictly like neurological kind of perspective would take and you're injecting like the anthropology and the ethnography into it in order to kind of draw it out a little bit better into something a little bit more tangible. Yeah, I think um, that's a that's a that's a good way to put it. So I mean, if you think about the history of anthropology in that sense, you know, some of what we do isn't that different from what Rivers, the psychologist, did going to do field work. Um, uh, even someone like Crower, if you look at his original 
textbook. It includes parts on psychology. It's very interdisciplinary before sort of we hardened into more narrow fields. But at the same time, I would say it's, it's about Boaz's insistence on variation, but in ways that might be marked more by uh, someone like Margaret Mead to get more the perspective of the people you're working with, or even someone like uh, Zora Neale Hurston, who really was more about doing a, you know, ethnography from the participant's point of view, not just from, from the anthropologist's point of view and capturing that type of variation. So in one sense, yeah, neuroanthropology is, is uh, just simply anthropology, as some people say, um, but it, it tries to, to weave together different strands, but still trying to do really good social science um, and, mm. and drawing on um, interdisciplinary approaches, as anthropology has done for a long time. Um, to try to try to understand human variation. Yeah, it's interesting how anthropology has become super specialized, right? And and I think in that, you know, sounds like neuroanthropology is trying to draw in this biological, you know, neurological perspective into anthropology. At the same time, like books have been, you know semi-recently also authored about how you know injecting the social and the the social perspective into like usually hardline biological perspectives is also happening you know it's almost like they're meeting in the middle in some ways because yeah i guess i'm wondering like you mentioned like anthropologists have been touching on these interdisciplinary things and it makes me think of how like i was recently uh, reading Geertz and, you know, him talking about how, you know, people are born incomplete, right? And then culture makes humans complete with symbols and, and all these things that it gives us. And, you know, in that there's this perspective that, you know, biology and culture evolved together, right? You couldn't have had the biologies that we have if it weren't for culture, you know, being able to communicate the ways that we have, whether it's through language or through, you know, the particular ways that we understand communication, being human is based off of the interaction between culture and biology. And I know in your research, you talk a lot about wanting to really flesh out that biocultural perspective. So do you have like an example from your research on addiction um, that you think kind of speaks to that? So, um, yeah, certainly I do. And uh, what I would, I guess, since we're talking about Gertz, I'll just start there. You know, that the that particular essay that you're you're talking about is one where he starts talking about that biocultural model. And then basically at the end of it, he says, you know, culture has you know, unleashed us from biology. Uh, but what's interesting is is in other essays, he, he does recognize material realities. He does recognize psychology, for example, and in, in how it helps manage uncertainty and things like that in, in religious systems. So, uh, so I, I, I think Gertz, um, in developing his approach to culture, helped define culture and gave us ways to work with it. But like many theorists, that was his focus. And so he sort of defined it against other, other things that he was interested in, but then didn't become part of how he tried to do his research. So, um, and and in contrast for me, uh, and that works, and that works for many problems, right? There, there are people who can take an entirely cultural approach, um, and I think that's valuable work. But in, in my case, butting up against addiction, it was clear to me from the start that there were biological and neurobiological components to addiction, that, that there are things that you couldn't just, in a sense, boil down to, to being in the wrong subculture or even kids um, in really unequal circumstances, they don't all end up having drug abuse problems. And so uh, so I recognized roles for individual variation and for, for biology um, early on, in part because I, I worked as a counselor to kids that had drug problems um, before, before I went to grad school. And, and those experience working with those kids in Colombia was what taught me that both cultures and society are really there, but so too are things that, that they struggle to understand, but they, they, they wish they could, you know, not have sort of the embodied biology they, they, 
they have or they want to go beyond it um, because they want to get back to normality. But uh, but they react differently. Um, and and so trying to to say, you know, in one sense, one way to put it is, you know, addiction runs through our brain, but our brains run through culture would be sort of how I'd want to sort of push uh, the Gertz approach um, is, is to yeah. say for specific problems, you need that other sort of other component so you can understand something um, that, you know, in medical parlance is a chronic relapsing disorder, but it's not like other relapsing disorders per se, it does share those features with them, but it also involves neurobiology, neuroplasticity, learning um, in ways that are, and meanings in ways that are different from, from more chronic diseases um, mm. like diabetes. And so in my work, it, what was interesting was both to find out that the wanting was powerfully there um, and they could describe it, but they could also describe other things like being deeply involved with something without necessarily being involved with it and how attention really plays a role and in which direction they go towards or away from drugs. But, but even things like wanting and attention, even urges, but particularly wanting and attention, had meanings attached to them that couldn't be reduced just to the neurobiology. Um, mm. And so there was uh, symbolisms there that were important to them personally, but also came from sort of cultural models that framed how to think about things, what, what drug use is good for. Um, and, and part of, I don't think it's enough in one sense to just try to unravel, say, the, the biology side or the cultural side um, like if you can get them to realize those meanings are false and they're no longer in denial, somehow that will solve the biology. Or if you can get them to, you know, take the right drugs and, and, and other types of things that might affect the biology more, reduce stress, then somehow the, the reasons why they used would go away. Um, so it's, it's really a conundrum there in the middle um, and, and what I'm still thinking about. Right. <clears throat> so I mean you're talking about how culturally addiction is mediated by the meanings that we have as well as the biology that's also there creating this like loop right mm -hmm. that you can't just break one chain in order to address it I guess that, that speaks to another thing of like is social media an addiction we talk about what is yeah, an addiction is social media addiction ah <laughs> Certainly it creates loops and it creates, um, it, it is, does, has been designed to create reinforcing loops that have been explicitly drawn from uh, psychological uh, science, from animal behavior science. So they, they know how to, to do that. And now it's being exploited even more broadly from people who then bring in rhetorical strategies um, uh, and harness narratives and things like that. So, so it's certainly, as we know, powerfully reinforcing lots of people do it. Um, and, and certainly you could argue that there are people who, you know, would meet a, a common sense definition of addiction that they spend too much time on it. That brings large personal and social costs. And, and in that sense, yeah, there's an emerging sort of recognition that, that people can be, and addictive might not be the right word here, but but the common sense would be addicted to it in a because of how you diagnose addiction is actually really by the consequences of it. Um, so if you mm -hmm. see certain types of consequences, then mm -hmm. then you say that person has a problem. Um, uh, so, but in of itself, like uh, just on their own as media. I don't think they're they're addictive sort of on their own. You have to create what you what you were saying those loops, um, and certain people have to find uh, reasons why why this that type of loop matters to them. It's not just the loop does all the work on its own. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's it exists the addictive potential of it exists interaction with people, um, not just in the technology itself. Right. Yeah. Um. I, so a part of neuroanthropology, because you, you mentioned like 
people being a little bit more heavily stressed on the anthropology aspect and I guess losing sight of like the biological mechanisms that are also within that feedback loop necessarily. And I guess, do you see your approach, yours and uh, Greg Downey's approach being kind of against the grain anthropology? Because ultimately, you know, we are super specialized and a few people in the department that I've, you know, like in, in my, in my program, in my cohort that, you know, I've talked about, like, there's an understanding that like there is a reticence for cultural anthropologists to dip into biology because I guess there's a feeling that that's like a slippery slope and then you'll get into like these biological rationales for like people's behaviors. And I guess there's this like anxiety about that. I don't know if you want to, you can speak to that or no, what do you think a, about that's a great that? question, Will. Um, and, and, and I think those anxieties exist for historical reasons. Um, uh, that that are both you know within within european and american societies um within the field of anthropology itself so and there you could say like the the, the critical approach that has been developed um by the field is actually sort of you know inoculation against that um so those same tools uh can help you in understanding where biology might, you know, be going down a more deterministic route or might be used in ways to justify violence or oppression. Um, so it's not like for anthropology in general, those critical tools are going to go away. Um, they, they, I think help you better engage with the biology. And uh, so, but nonetheless, the biology has uh, the way I put it in a paper that's, under review right now is, you know, anthropology has been really good at say and do. Um, and we were just want to expand it to say, do, and process. And that processing is, is not just done by culture. It's done also by neuro, neurobiology, by uh, material forces. Um, so the processing doesn't all have to happen in the brain at all. Often happens you, in interaction define, between people. Huh? How are you defining processing? Uh, I, in a very general way, it's just sort of a shorthand. So, but in this sense, uh, the processual approach is something that, you know, goes way back to, to, to the sixties, um, and Mm. takes different forms. One would be, um, looking at it in terms of algorithms and that went down one route. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff on computational neuroscience now, which is, uh, often very reductive, but, but can help you model things. Um, but I, I mean it as sort of you can, you, more sort of how linguistic anthropology looks at how things play out, um, how they really get into the, the nitty gritty of how something works. Um, and in that sense, process is a way to, to, to try to account for that without necessarily, you know, evoking some of the functionality or te- teleology that can come with 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 both biological evolutionary reasoning and even some cultural reasoning, right? You know, mm-hmm. the culture dictates that you should be this way, and so people end up that way. It's sort of that's that's not a great explanation. Um, so I, I think, in that broad sense, process helps you have something that can work in interaction with this emphasis on you know people say things, mean things, create symbolic realities. People do things that can be at odd with it. Um, and, and then people outside of even saying and doing have things going on inside themselves and between people that they're not necessarily recognizing, but that also shape what play out. And I think that's a, a longstanding interest in, in anthropology. You know, you could go right back to someone like Malinowski, um, and trying to have a more functional view. And again, it's a slippery slope, but, but that type of work of, of, say Gert saying cultures in public and between people and it's symbolic doing. So well, what does that doing consist of and what are some of the mechanisms involved? So a shorthand would be a process is, you know, akin to mechanistic thinking of just trying to break things down into components and see how things work. Um, mm-hmm. You know, today those components or processes work in dynamic ways rather than sort of the more, reductive ways that that 
earlier generations of neuroscience did it or or in the more reductive ways of systemic ways that someone like Bateson definitely tried to innovate. Um, but again, it, it ends up being a sort of a closed system rather than all these components coming together in interesting ways. Right. And in a lot of ways, it's like it, it never was sure within closed systems, but like you're touching on, I think specializing and, and I guess really looking at particular processes can get us there. And I guess you mentioned something about uh, how were we defining and developing culture and different differences within cultures. You know, I, I guess it made me think about how, you know, we now live in a digitized world where, you know, people have different lives on social media, right? Um, like I, I have friends who live and grew up right next to each other who believe completely different things, right? One of them's fairly conservative and the other one's pretty, I guess, liberal. In fact, I have a few friends who are, you know, conservative and, and one of them has a super liberal brother and you know within a single family you have people having completely different I guess beliefs and and values and and the fact that we can obtain information and process it ourselves and then decide what it is that we want everyone has at their fingertips you know even in the global south I mean a lot of people have mobile phones not everyone but now there's there's access at least to the internet and information and and how is that defining and changing culture and and yeah values and affiliation but also how we you know create culture within ourselves and now act on it you know oh yeah it's it's really i think goes in line with some of the stuff that you were you know writing um recently about like global connections and, and those, those different affiliations that we have with different people who we believe, believe what we believe. And then, you know, that becomes a reality in itself. Yeah. And this is a hard problem. I'm, I, you know, for a long time, culture theory, rightly so has focused in on the, the sort of shared or collective aspects of of, of society or of culture, um, you know, going right all the way back to someone like Durkheim, um, hmm. that social facts can't be reduced down to individual facts. And, but we find ourselves in a time where the empirical questions that are interesting to get at is precisely that there can be both these sort of social realities, um, realities are, that are socially constructed but people, even though they might share certain aspects of it, won't share other aspects of it. And, and I think social media has really, you know, it's just a new form of media that increases the ability to, um, to, to create sort of those divergent processes. Um, a thought that strikes me now just talking about it, though, is, you know, if you think about culture as a problem to be solved and how it does its work, sort of that processual view, um, one thing that strikes me is is we can do that precisely because we we are living in an increasingly uniform world, right? Um, mm. So if if the problem to be solved is how you get people together and work together and create that sort of stuff, you know, we've done that with globalization. We've done that with... Um, you know, capitalist approaches. We've done that with state level societies. So there are all these things that create or provide an infrastructure for sharedness. And, uh, and so at the individual level, that's not a problem you are trying to solve. Um, you're trying to, you know, find where you're going to be able to create some of that sharedness that, that will help you or that's compelling or, or whatever type of approach you might take to, to, to how people try to figure out what, what their niche is or mm. something like that. So, um, so maybe because yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tough question. Go back to what you're talking about. I, I think, you know, one of the things that's really struck me is, um, thinking about social media and say the current issue in the United States is, um, people get so worked up 
not because they're so different, but because they're so similar, right? So we don't get worked up about what's happening, um, say, in sub-Saharan Africa as much as we get worked up about our neighbors or who in our family. Um, and part of that is, I think, is solved because we are biological beings that, that pay attention to what's more in our immediate environment. I think that gets a lot, you most of the way there. But, but the cultural side would be, would be saying it's precisely because you, there are things at stake um, that, that cultural dimensions or social relationships that are at stake that, that make it much more vital. Um, and, and so I think that part of recognizing that there are things that, that drive people to have, you know, shared agreements about what's important, but really differing opinions or differing, you know, reinforcing mechanisms about of the, that sort of set of array of things. What, where are you trying to be in the mix or who's, who are your allies or things like that? Mm -hmm. You know, touching on what you're talking about in terms of culture, in terms of like, yeah, in, in so many ways, the world is more uniform than ever. And I think it's interesting that each of us, each of our worlds are just one subset of that. You know, like, because of the way that algorithms work on social media, on YouTube and everything, it just gives you more of what it is that sparked your attention. You know, it's, it's attention seeking, which goes back to what you're talking about addiction, right? It's, it's about your attention and, um, you know, it, it's about wanting. But now we have this algorithm that plays on what you want and is going to give you more in order to incite. In the plainest terms, incite interaction which often means through inciting your emotions in order to get you to comment, in order to like, or to say, this guy's an asshole, whatever it might be that you want to put on social media. And I guess touching on like that sharedness, the, that aspect that we call culture, you know, Bill Dressler has talked about cultural consonants, right? And, and how do you kind of, how do you measure culture in so many ways? And I was thinking of like, that a lot recently, especially doing more like uh, stats classes. And I think it, I think, you know, there's aspects of it that have to be updated because of social media, you know, because the fact is what my brothers and what my friends all believe, you know, they often show me or send me videos that'll tell me kind of some form of truth, right? Whether it's a video about how, you know, coronavirus is not, it's it's a hoax to some extent or if it's about how you know why trump is or was a, a great candidate to, to vote for you know like there's these little pieces that people play on and and you know I, I guess how do you define culture in that atmosphere where what it is that you see and now your at least social media reality is so specific so this one aspect of the internet, you know, how, how it's, it's a complicated kind of process that's going on, but actually not so complicated because the algorithms work as, as, as designed in so many ways. So, all right. So these are strong. Good question. So I guess the first place I would start is just with an example I, is, no, I think I, you know, I think many of us have experienced, I've heard people comment it, you see them commenting on it in, in YouTube videos that, you know, you go down this YouTube video yeah. hole and, and three hours later, you're like, how did I end up watching <laughs> this? Right. Yeah. And people comment on, on that. And, and certainly I've done that. Um, and sometimes you end up in really weird spaces. Sometimes you end up in spaces that are like, wow, I never knew about this stuff. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. Um, and, and then you start to see that there's certain videos from people who are putting up content that are, that, that just get an enormous amount of popularity and the rest of that person's content doesn't really get any views. Right. Um, so obviously YouTube is directing your, your attention in certain ways. They're, they're finding paths that are more well-worn mm -hmm. and in a sense that is then be, becoming culture, right? Um, because you're going down shared paths, um, this is probably the wrong metaphor, but it's, and I actually haven't played this game, but I've watched my, my kids play it, but it, it's kind of like, 
YouTube is doing Dark Souls um, gaming where you, you have to figure out how to solve the problem by watching where other people have gone and failed and stuff like right. that. Um, and, and so that, I think that sense of people's action coming together with processes, in this case, algorithms and content that's created by other people that can be engaging and is often edited in ways to try to maximize that. Um, that that's a material reality um, that, that exists outside of any one person and thus is, is something that should be labeled social or cultural. Um, but it's different, I think, from, from the dresser approach. Um, and I'll, I'll, because precisely because it, it emphasizes the doing or engagement part rather than the say or knowing or knowledge part. Um, so we don't, we have very, very few, um, ways of trying to measure culture and the cultural consensus and, and then dressers innovation with consonants that that's really one of the very good social science ways to try to get at some of that shared reality. But it's still a it's on the say side of things. It's on the ideas side of things. How people think about things, um, and and thus misses out other ways that we create shared um, engagements. Uh, and there, there I think the more we can come up with ways that capture features of what people do in, in common or shared ways is uh, is is useful. Um, and what well, what might be a way to try to mediate between you know, more cultural views and more biological views is precisely by tending to, to, to doings, but doings in a way that aren't as sort of rigidly defined as there are just practices that, you know, that are structure, everything, but you have to have that dynamic view of how practices or how doings emerge just as in, in the way you would talk about the, the, the YouTube um, phenomenon of, you know, people creating specific types of content, often drawing on symbolic means, um, the algorithm providing you feedback, you're engaging, your own interests are getting the, and through that process, you are also changing how you engage with that particular medium. Um, and so I think that type of sort of social technology, if you want to use that language approach, is, is something anthropologists have, have recognized, um, but we haven't necessarily switched as much to you know what does that mean for theories of culture that 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 because i think we've been doing that sort of stuff you know pretty much for almost two million years right i mean you think about tool making or care for children these sorts of things that that really made a difference to um you know the diversification of homo and and the emergence of, of more of the sort of ideological types of culture that sort of basis in in doing and and shared doing in uh, many different shapes, I think is something that's really fundamental to to our species, and is also beyond language and ideas, also something that makes us different. Though you can see certain phenotypic similarities with with other creatures that do that sort of thing, such as chimpanzees and tool making, um, you know, collective decision making among certain social mammals. They they do certain things that are similar, but we're able to, you know, make it repeatable in a way that other species don't necessarily mm. have as great an ability to sort of make that something that then shapes the biology of the, the people growing right. up. In it. That's, I'm glad you touched on like those, those aspects, the interspecies kind of perspective. I, I was reading Haraway not too long ago and like other things in, in terms of, ontologies and, and all that literature and I think I was I was looking at my dog the other day right because I was taking my final exam yesterday and I was super anxious I could just see my dog staring at me right like and I'm wondering like what does he think is going on because I'm just sitting here anxious nothing's happening in his mind probably but I'm just anxious and you know then I do the exam and I'm done with it and I've calmed down and um you know, it reminds me that the other day, Frankie and I took him to the dog park. And there was a previous incident where this one dog just went at him. You know, like, he got on the bench and the dog still got, like, went at him and, like, you know, with her teeth. And it was a bigger dog because, you know, Freddie's a, a medium-sized um, dog. And uh, 
you know, when we first walked into the fence like a few days ago of the dog park, there was a bunch of dogs everywhere and all of his back hair just went up, you know, you know, super aggressive. And there was a bunch of dogs around him and he was sniffing them just fine. But I'm like, what is he reacting to? Then we look across the park and there's the dog with the owner who the owner is taking the dog off of another dog and now they're leaving, you know? So that dog has like a history of going for other dogs. Um, but it's interesting because Freddie, it's like we realize in that moment because, you know, he like, <clears throat> you know, went around the dog. So he completely knows the dog, right? And in that moment, I was thinking he's probably reacting to, you know, the smell of the dog, probably saw the dog as soon as we walked in. And like it's in that moment, it was like there's no doubt that he, at least for us, that he was reacting to that other aggressive dog who had attacked him before. <clears throat> so like we saw his feedback to us, right? that he was reacting in that way. And we were like, what the heck is going on, right? And so that's the like analogous situation that I saw probably for him to being like, what the heck is going on? You know, I'm sitting in front of this computer being nervous. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what's interesting, right? Because, you know, we're filtering it through our own realities and through our own how we see the world. And I think humans, you know, there's something that I was dealing with recently that Frankie and I were kind of talking about with Freddie, which was like, he jumps on us whenever other dogs come near us, right? He, when we first got him, he was super nervous. And I guess he had been attacked by people who pre previously uh, tried to adopt him by their dogs. Um, hmm. And so, you know, whenever he jumps on us for a while, it was like wanting to put him down so that he wouldn't do it. But then I think, on some level, Frankie and I were talking about how, you know what, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable to be like, okay, our dog's all, all over us now, you know, and for one, that means like, okay, our dog isn't that social compared to other dogs. And, you know, like there's, there's like a fear of judgment that we had of other people looking at us and being like, you know, their dog's, you know, scared and probably going to attack our dog. And um, especially with some of those like bad situations with other dogs, like going for him. Um, so I think that was something interesting, right? Like we're projecting our own judgments about people and even other dogs on our dog, right? Where now we're telling him, get down. And ultimately, without saying it, be cool, right? And, you know, how unfair that felt when we kind of got to that, kind of like dealing with our own emotions in order to be able to deal with the situation a little bit better. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think, yeah, I think culture can be unfair, right. Um, and sort of creating those, those judgments, the shared reactions. And that would be why I think, you know, a processual approach gives you a, alongside a critical approach, but the processual approach gives you a different understanding of it. Oh, wait, our dog's reacting. Oh, wait, his hair's up for a reason. Oh, he smelled the other dog. Suddenly you attend to these different things that sort of get you beyond, um, often very fast social judgments about what we're supposed to do. And, um, and because it's, uh, because they, the dog, I mean, the dog certainly is a cultural being like Airways work would establish. I mean, I think of our dog who, you know, he patrols our, our property. Right. And so the suburban property mm -hmm. is suddenly his territory. It's a, it's a weird combo, but that's, but he has it very clear in his head that that this is the the area that that he should you know we are that's one of our dogs he should defend our other dog is super sweet um and, but outside that territory he's, he's actually kind of nervous um but inside of it he's like this is i've got to you know defend yeah, the yeah, pack kind sure. of thing um yeah. and so so he's both still this a dog you know but but he he's how he reacts and interacts with the world is definitely shaped by his immediate environment and, and by us. And we've had to learn how to manage him in certain ways just because, you know, you, you can't really reason with him in those, mm -hmm. those moments, right? He's, he, 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 he just gets really worked up and it's just, you just got to make sure that, um, that, that, yeah, you can manage it because it takes him about 20 minutes to calm down. Like when someone comes over the yeah. house that he doesn't know, just because he gets so worked up about it and he can't, he literally cannot uh, think of anything else. Um, then I need to like defend. And, but then he comes down and, and you can reintroduce him, but he can't, he cannot process any other information mm. in those, 
in that first sort of burst of, of energy and I'm sure cortisol right. and other sorts of stuff that um, get him really riled up. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's just interesting how we, you know, have to figure out these different techniques and share them. I mean, those are some of the things I think, and I'm not as familiar with this type of literature and there's, I think, you know, ways that to push it, but uh, I do think sort of looking at ta- ta- te- techniques and tasks and that kind of thing is another area where, you know, there'll be good overlap between cognitive science and some types of cultural analysis, which look at some of the sorts of things, whether it's from ritual to materiality, um, but, but looking specifically at the task and then the processes involved in that task in a social way. Um, and there's actually been research done on with dogs. Like, I mean, if you think about um, how herding dogs come together with flocks of sheep, with um, trainers who then manage them, it's all one system. It's all working together, but it has very specific parts to it that make it work. And not all dogs can do it. Not all, uh, you know, there's those funny videos you find of like the world's worst mm-hmm. herding dog and the sheep aren't really taking them seriously and, or the person doesn't know how to train the dog to do it. So it's, it has very specific components to it. But if you get that, you can have this, that sort of system that, that, uh, that particular groups of people have used for centuries. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Especially thinking about that dog, right? Like, are the, are the, are the sheep now, is there stress reaction being prompted by the dog in order to get them to do what they want? Or has it just been habituated? Like dogs coming, we should go this way. Like, cause I guess in thinking about, you know, your dog and the stress response, like in no way is it obvious that that should be the response, right? Like it's, it's probably based off of usually what happens, right? If you had people coming over every day since you first got your dog, no doubt that, you know, it would look different. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think, yeah, that's, that's really interesting to see exactly, I guess, in precise terms, how I guess culture, or I guess in this sense, routine and biology kind of come into, to play together. Cause I know for sure our dog, Freddie, he, um, he, he can, he start off really nervous you know, really just anxious and kind of just not really cool with other dogs. And now, like, we finally got him to the point where he's running off with other dogs, and it's really nice to see. Um, but I guess in that, I'm wondering what has happened. And in thinking about addiction, I think a- another part that's often linked to addiction is trauma. I don't know if you could speak to that sort of in your research. What do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think... Uh, the- the way I put it is addiction runs along uh, the fault lines of society, both large and small. So certainly it runs along major axes of inequality, um, but it can also happen in particular households where there are specific traumas to that, that um, family. And there's no, in the sense of the, of addiction as a problem, I, I don't think it's useful to privilege one over the other, I think, but, but most people, not all people, but most people who have, substance use or sort of those types of problems, engagement problems have had trauma of one sort of another in their past. Um, but, but I, you know, both clinically and in my research, there's also people who have had relatively good lives who just get too deeply involved. Um, uh, where the worst sort of consequences come are where you have people who have suffered um, traumas of whatever size and multiple parts of them. So there's a you know famous study called uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and they measure ten sort of things like a death in the family, you know, divorce, um, being being abused. The more of those you have, you know, like the worst your overall health outcomes of both physical and mental health are over your lifespan. Um, but what happens with something like uh, addiction is the you define it by consequences. Um, and, and so like one of the worst types, one of the, the criteria that's most linked to the most destructive pieces of addiction is where you no longer take care of social responsibilities like work or being a parent or going to school. Um, but that goes back to what you're talking about before of how we become judgmental of people who aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and so they're not supposed to do this kind of thing in school or they're not supposed to do this. 
and we often start to exclude them or have social costs on them. And so it's a double-edged sword. I think, you know, some of those social costs in certain circumstances can guide people to, um, to going back to a better path, maybe for their lives, whatever definition of better means. But for people who are increasingly excluded, then it becomes that much more difficult. So when you get both traumas that are in the past related to, you know, unequal consequences on people who don't have any control over those consequences, then you can have really destructive outcomes from addiction. Um, whereas I'll sometimes make the argument that, you know, like uh, someone like a Saudi prince who goes out and uses every, you know, parties all the time and would many people see as someone has a substance abuse problem because he's just drinking or using drugs all the time. But they have so much wealth that there really are no consequences for that person. Um, and, and thus, thus in that, in the sense of addiction as a social problem, isn't, he's not an addict in the way we would mean that we have to address the social ills that come along with something like, like, uh, most cases of addiction. Um, so it's a rare case. It's a counter example, but, but I, I, I think where we get the traumas, from before together with traumas that come with associated with using that's where you get the worst types of outcomes right yeah <clears throat> I, I you talked about processing earlier and you know I, i've i've mm -hmm. been kind of big on reading about emotional processing recently and um and I, you know in reading some of the excerpts of some of your um writings on on your participants like seeing the feelings that they had about let's say what uh being under the influence or being high versus being sober and and you know the kinds of things that it, it seems like on some on some level for some of them like the things that they would have to 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 address and to confront in order to feel better not you know feel better while sober just felt like too much for them and I guess in that, I know I see that like, you know, there's, there's probably some, some shame, self-judgment and, you know, a lot of feelings that are, are sort of hard to reconcile in order to even begin to have that process of, I guess, being able to address addiction. I guess it, it just seems more like, you know, there, there's so much that needs to be addressed and kind of like you said, like addictions defined by, you know, all of these, all of these, out, all of these things, right. All of these, um, um, social and kind of just, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, I guess uh, it's based, it revolves around our circumstances, right? Like what does it cause in our lives? And I guess in some ways it seems like that focus, you know, you're trying to sort of broaden that focus into to trying to draw that out a little bit. And, you know, I think, I think that's sort of where I'm sort of sticking, right? Like, what does a person have to be able to process for themselves in order to be able to move through that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what most people would say is they, you know, you need to first make sure that, well, a couple things. One, you have to sort of reduce social conflicts in your lives because that will sort of put you in that stage where you react more immediately, just like my dog does. And that's not good for trying to manage something like addiction. Um, so addressing those social conflicts. And then the other thing is addressing social relationships mm -hmm. that lead you towards you. So, um, people who use are often surrounded by other people use and they, they, you know, just as with social media, they sort of form a bubble of saying this is okay and minimizing consequences and um, reinforcing what they're doing. And, and so making people redevelop relationships that they've often lost are part of it. So those are sort of minimal, minimal things. And um, then from there, do you have to process, you know, the emotions or the traumas. Uh, I, I think people would say different things about that. Uh, what, what I would say is 
at, at a minimum, you have to rework in some way the if your emotional traumas or or whatever is causing you pain is then been linked to you using drugs to mm. to change away from that that combination is is not good um so if it, and it's it labeled in different ways right drowning your sorrows would be sorrows would be a you know a euphemism for it Self-medication um, would be another way to do it. I don't think it's really self-medication. Sometimes I just want to get in a different state. Um, so, but when you use uh, experiences, including substance-driven experiences, to escape from negative emotions, then that connection, that linkage, is a way you solve the problem. Your brain's very good at, at repeating that, um, and so breaking that that linkage is is necessary from there i think you know people make different decisions about how much emotional processing if you solve all those emotional problems then somehow the 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 linkage will go away it's, it's that that's not actually right because you've you've already established your brain remembers how to do these things really well um so if you just like solve the emotional problems you still have the habit there um or that linkage and it doesn't mean that you won't face circumstances again where where suddenly you feel all those emotional issues come up. Um, this is often what happens with relapse. Um, this it goes back to social conflicts again, and suddenly that thing that you haven't really reworked that connection it, is, and you're stressed becomes really an obvious option for solve how to solve a problem in the moment for your brain. Um, not not you consciously or subjectively just. It, you know, the brain's trying to do the best it can in that moment. Um, and that's, so I would say that linkage between negative emotions and using experiences to create a state change, either towards something that's not negative or towards something that's positive, or even just something that's different, like getting you out of the house and, and mm -hmm. being out with friends. Um, that's, that's, I mean, research has consistently supported it. Um, but how you get that, how you address that in, because it's so circumstantial right. is a very difficult problem. I think it, I kind of want to link this to something else. Um, like this, this idea of like emotions escaping and how we're sort of addressing it and talking about it. Cause I, you know, I, I speak regularly with uh, my friend Bryant, who's usually doing these with me. Um, um, and about let's say manhood, right. Or what it means to be a man or masculinity. Right. And I had I've had these conversations with Frankie too, and in a recent one we we're talking, and um, she mentioned that like you know when whenever we see or hear about like um, you know men having like a a chip on their shoulder about like you know a woman in their life, whether it's a boss or something like that, it's it's usually our I think in some subsets of you know. In, in the US in our culture, there's there's people who wanted to sort of write that off as like, oh, misogyny and it's the patriarchy sort of, you know, being active within our lives, right? Um and at the same time, there's some underlying something that 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 is there as well that's playing on that. It isn't only these this systemic patriarchal structure that's gonna be causing that maybe that guy's mother was abusive, right? Or maybe, you know, people have suffered some trauma at the hands of someone else that they haven't really addressed, you know? And I guess that sort of speaks to complicating it, right? And not just sort of shrugging it off as one thing. Because on, you know, the opposite end of it, when we talk about, like, you know, women having daddy issues, right? Um, you know, there, there isn't really any turning towards like some systemic thing other than, oh, you know, it, it's still judgmental, surely, but it's, it's sort of judgmental in a way that sort of individualizes a woman into like, you know, their pro father probably wasn't there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's both a way of sort of offhanded shrugging it off, but at the same time, you know, acknowledging something that isn't necessarily that, you know, 
you're a bad person who's like part of this patriarchal structure and you're just reinforcing that, right? And I guess, I guess, yeah, I'm sort of thinking about those things and I guess I wanted to ask you like, you know, how, what do you think about like masculinity and femininity and, and the ways that we sort of attend to them, but even how they've sort of come up in your research? I don't, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll, I'll start with the research side and then we can move into the, I guess, personal view side. I, you know, in certainly Colombia and the U.S. and places in Europe, too, they're, they're highly gendered societies. Gender is a you know, cross-cultural, near universal, um, just doesn't always work the same way that we think. And in Colombia, what I found among adolescents was that that adolescent boys had a much greater range of uh, ability to sort of be close to the house or be out in the street. And in in this sense, street was more identified with the masculine domain, la, la, la calle, and then la casa, the home, would be more feminine. Um, it doesn't always work exactly that way, but... Um, but in the context of their lives, it, it does. Um, and so you'd find the, a wide variety of people all the way, all the way to, you know, the worst type of street kids to kids that have drug problems but still live at home and were spoiled by their parents. And with girls, though, there wasn't that sort of intermediate space that they were either kept closer to home or pushed to the worst domains of, of society. Um, and so there wasn't the same flexibility in their um, gender roles that that boys had. Um, they suffered many more consequences. So that's sort of a bifurcation among the girls that I, I worked with that didn't exist among the boys. Um, but in a cross-cultural sense, you know, I think it's interesting because in in Latin America. I think there's a greater ability to, to negotiate at the, the time I was doing research, I think, you know, it's, it would be different now. And I can't speak to now as, as well in Colombia, but I, I felt that women could negotiate both being um, feminine, but also being successful, that those weren't seen as, as contradictory in some of the ways that we see, common tropes in the United States of, of, mm. uh, oh, you know, a cheerleader can't be smart. Right. Um, and so they had more room to, to both be successful and particularly among, not so much among the, the, the lower middle class people, but middle class and upper middle class to both, you know, go to school, be successful, but also have these sort of separate domains that are recognized as, as feminine. Um, and a lot, for example, a lot less judgment. In fact, much more societal praise there over beauty pageants and things like that. Um, whereas we make more jokes about it, even though we still have them. So, so in other domains, I felt they, you know, they could negotiate femininity in ways that I think um, were different from my experiences growing up. Um, um, that, uh, yeah, that there's a certain rigidity that. Uh, you know, because I went to a boy's school and there's a girl's school across the street and that, that they just, I didn't see that same kind of dynamic that I saw in Colombia. Um, whether that's rep representative of the United States of a whole, I don't know. This is not my area of expertise, but it's just something I picked up on. Um, so, but that sort of brings me back to anthropology and how, how, how we do, you know, go back to um, the statement of making the world safe for human differences. And, and so I, as you know, socially constructed part, masculine and feminine are things that people should feel safe being able to express in various ways rather than being judged for them that it makes them part of a patriarchy or, or part of, um, you know, being a feminist. And you see both those sides in the United States. So, um, but I think anthropology struggles at time with, with that, U.S. anthropology to, to let people express um, their femininity or express their masculinity or express other gender identities um, that, that are also important to them. And uh, so I still think, you know, 
how people negotiate that because femininity and masculinity and um, in non-binary terms is something that anthropology knows a lot about, but we don't always address how that doesn't always play out the way, the way that sort of ethnographic reality across cultures doesn't work that way in one society, particularly the United States. So, um, so I, I think it's a negotiation for, for how you can figure out ways to, to express whatever part of, of, of you sort of fits in a range of possibilities, not just a, a dichotomy. And, and I, I don't, as you said before, I don't think our, our societies yet are always plain safe. We judge more people for that. Um, and, and so it's interesting because I, there are certain moments where it's not marked and certain moments where it's marked. So when I used to teach at a, a private university, um, I taught a class on alcohol and drugs. And one of my favorite activities was to do them was to get the, the, the girl students and the boy students together. See, I'm being a dichotomy right there. And then get them to describe what they thought the other gender was doing <laughs> on a Saturday night as they got ready, right? For, for well, what was pre-gaming like and what were when they got to the party, what were the other groups thinking? And it was, what was amazing about it was how reductive say the girls were about what the boys were doing and the boys were about what the girls were doing. And, and the, the guys were like, we're just trying to like hang out and have some beers and talk. And, and the girls were like, we're just putting on makeup and, and things like, and they didn't. And then that led into some really unfortunate times. I and mean, it's mm. funny, but in unfortunate times, misconceptions about what, what, what boys and girls were looking for when they got together. Um, and I think in ways that, that, didn't help them relate all the time and, and could lead to gendered violence. Um, uh, so, but it was this, just this interesting moment when I finally would get them to like actually talk about mm -hmm. what they did. Cause they prepared that too. And it, it opened eyes because they just don't right. know. And they make these assumptions that are very gendered. So, um, and in that space, it's really interesting because like when they go out, it's so highly gendered. And then I would point out to them that, in the space of the classroom, it's so ungendered, right? They're, everyone's, particularly if it's a morning class, they're all wearing sweat clothes and they're all androgynous to a certain degree. And and I think in the United States, that's sort of one of our default options is this, this sort of emphasis on being androgynous. Um, and that's that's not, I mean, what I say is I don't think that's the only option is 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 the default public option is, is being androgynous. I think other cultures, you know, give third genders, um, give m multiple genders. Um, and so, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated issue. And I think the, someone who's, you know, a real expert, such of women and gender studies would surely have lots to say back to me. Um, and, and rightly so, but I, 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 my basic point is we have to figure out better ways to create mm. more spaces where people can negotiate what, what's possible for them. Um, and, and, and that can happen, uh, both for men and women, um, and as well as for transgender or other, other, uh, identities that people have. And, and we have a long ways to go on that. Right. I think, I think that judgment that people can kind of look forward to kind of encountering. Yeah. I think, I think that's a big part of it for sure. Like, um, kind of like the class experiment you're talking about, like <clears throat> ultimately it's, it's, there's, they're very loaded, right? The kinds of objects or the kinds of things they thought that the others were doing, you know, it's very probably stereotypical and in some ways probably insulting. Um, and I, certainly think that that's you know a lot of it can be kind of developed by i think you know we we talk in stereotypes right in these hard dichotomies in our culture right like men do this and women do this and ma you know masculinity looks like this and femininity femininity looks like this and i think 
like a recent video that one of my friends sent me. It was, um, you know, it was about how, you know, I guess, and, and I guess what you talked about in, in terms of like all your students wearing sweatpants and dressing sort of androgynous, um, I was talking about how, you know, women have been allowed to, you know, be more androgynous, whereas men have been, for the most part, really still, if anything, androgynous looks slightly more masculine today because women are allowed to be yeah, you know, dressed more so that way. And, and the point of that video was, you know, something like the ultimate, like, point of that video was men should be men. Um, but I think it got me to think about, yeah, like what sort of judgments are people encountering and how is that affecting people's behaviors? How is it affecting people's reactions and emotions? And cause I think when, when it comes to videos that can spark emotions, like the type that we've been talking about on social media, a lot of it can be reactionary. It can be based off of the judgments that they feel they may or may perceive other people have on them. And a lot of those are probably real. But yeah, I guess it, it just sort of makes me think about how judgments and I think on some level, I think we react a lot more often than we, we think we do. You know, I think I've, I've certainly learned that about myself, like sort of reacting and it takes time. And I think that's that's another part of kind of what you've touched on in terms of like disentangling these feedback loops when it comes to biology and social and cultural and individual psychological aspects. Like I think on a deep level, it takes time and, and that's kind of hard to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look at a social phenomenon like Jordan Peterson um, and how he appealed to, to so many men um, and by, by, you know, wrapping together academic ideas, um, whether you agree with those ideas or not, but he certainly drew on academic uh, style to then speak to, to many men who felt disaffected. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I think offering other ways of being a man if you're talking about that or masculinity is is something that um certainly people out there want um and and has gotten filled in social media um i'm not suggesting that that's something academics should run out to do but i i do think we need to have more roles for public intellectuals and in these spaces so that it's not just the most reactionary elements in these. And, um, and I don't think universities have done enough to support it, uh, up to this point, you know, we, we are still focused on research and, on on teaching as our teaching is a wonderful public, um, engagement. But I think in these spaces that have been rapidly populated, I think, universities haven't gone far enough in supporting faculty and students who want to also be in those spaces and to reward them for the work there that that they can do just to offer a, a different voice or a more complicated view um, or a better accounting of what the research says. And so if we recognize theoretically and empirically that these things are happening and they work on these sort of feedback loops and these worn material pathways that are ideological and algorithmic, then, then just staying in the ivory tower isn't going to help solve that problem that, um, and I, there's plenty of people who are not saying the ivory tower, but I, I do think we need to sort of reimagine the role for the public intellectual, that it's not just the one big public intellectual who has the big book deals that, but that it's more an active engagement by many, many people uh, to to create a public in these spaces, um, and that's um, not something that's always rewarded in academia. But I, I think it's vital because it's become such a part of how we are understanding things, and um, and to get our content out in different ways, but also get engagement done in in multiple ways, just so we interact with a broader range of students, just like we interact with a broad range of students when they 
they come into our classes. Um, but we don't have anything analogous for how can have sort of public classrooms or, or forums or stuff like that. And TED Talks mm -hmm. are not that. I'm talking about something that's more, um, yeah, more active or more akin to what the interactions you can have in a classroom, but on social media. And it, it can be, it can be tough. There, it can be really rough. There can be a lot of negative reactions. And I admire the people who are out there, particularly women, um, who face a lot, a lot of pushback and a lot of really nasty mm -hmm. comments. So, um, so, but I think finding the ways that we can sort of create those types of public spaces for engagement with what the university offers I, is, is important, an important step to keep developing. Yeah, that's really a good point. And I think a completely different point that Jordan Pearson brings up in his, like, um, what he doesn't like about academia, right? Which, by the way, like, a lot of my friends like him and, and really appreciate his content, and I can surely see why um, in some ways. But I think the irony is that I think he, he, he also gives everyone someone to blame, and that's, you know, left-leaning, you know, this part of academia when... In a lot of ways, it's in the entirety of in the structure of academia that's kind of the issue, um, and I guess that that's yeah, yeah. And you know, he he some stuff is not as clear, but you know, he he would probably say he calls a spade a spade, and and you know, if you look at the way I've been talking, I've been very careful and cautious and trying to not say certain things because I'm worried about how I'm going to get judged um, and that doesn't work as well in public spaces um, right. because it, it's just takes too long. Uh, hmm. But on the other hand, I've learned, you know, getting involved in flame wars with people really doesn't work either. Um, and, and so somewhere between sort of the long sort of hinting at things versus calling a spade a spade and getting a flame war, we have to find, ways of encouraging public discourse hmm. um and and that are supported institutionally um because you know journalism's having a really tough time the the big tech companies increasingly control the flow of content hmm. and the more that we can figure out how to how to also support that and make sure that that the things that we um think need to be part of how people understand the world and the things that we spend so much of our careers on are available to, to people outside of academia. That's, that's, that's a needed part of, I think of academic labor. That's, um, doesn't fit traditional models. Mm. Do you have, um, any sort of anything in mind as a way to do that, that you're kind of thinking about? Not, not really, to be honest. I, I, uh, the, the, the main thing is, is to, uh, from an institutional level to recognize that as part of academic labor and to let mm -hmm. your students and, and professors figure out what's going to work best for them. I don't think there's like a one size solution. You know, there are one of people doing YouTube, there's Instagram, there's Facebook, you don't like those those companies. There are other ways you can do it, such as small scale podcasting. Um, uh, so, but if if that so it could be counted as a type of public teaching, um, and that you would be able to dedicate parts of your time to doing that, um, then it would it it would, it would look different. And I think so. That would be one of the concrete things for me is just how it looks from the institutional side rather than dictating that there's, we're going to be able to create some new tech company that changes the world. I, mm. I think that's already been done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, that's not, that's not the academic space that, um, I mean, we can imagine utopias, but too often that ends up being things and we're just critiquing um, rather than doing. So I, I think I would say is, 
get more people out there doing it. Some of them might find ways to develop sort of these, some of these things, but other, other people might just want to focus on, on reach and using the existing mechanisms. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's super possible. Like it's super possible that, cause we have so much kind of there that we can work with. And yeah, I think by definition, we're going to have to work within the big social media and, you know, tech companies that, you know, kind of have all of that. And I think you touched on something really important, which is like a lot of these podcasts that I've done, they have been with academics and yeah, like there, there's, there's that filtered, you know, feeling that I've had through it. And I've had it too, because I also want to, have wanted to be like, you know, respectful of people's public images. And like, there's a lot that's, that I've had to navigate. I think that I, that I guess in some ways has put me off to focusing only on academics and kind of wanting to branch out to non-academics. And because even if I, you know, preached, uh, approached people in my cohort, you know, they, they, they want careers, you know, and, you know, academia is still very rigid in terms of like, you know, making sure that you're professional and can represent yourself and the university. Well, I think that's, that's a part of it that I think a lot of people have not been that comfortable with doing. And yeah, I don't know if I'm putting myself, you know, on the chopping block to, to sort of go that route, but I, I don't know. I, I also want to, I think it'll be more interesting that way. <laughs> And, and be more interesting, I, you know, to go back to that is, is what creates engagement. So, <laughs> uh, and, and not having the necessarily the reductive engagement, but the more interesting leading to, to new possibilities. Um, there's a huge, huge audiences for those, those types of, of content. Um, mm-hmm. It just takes a lot of time. I mean, you know, at the, the height of, the height of when I was blogging and I had an active audience between, you know, based on Google Analytics of like twenty to thirty thousand people. Um, so much greater reach uh, than I have in a classroom. Mm. It, but it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work to create content uh, on a regular basis that would keep people involved, um, and to to also respond to things that people want to see you respond to, which is you know things happening in news cycles or right. stuff like that. Yeah. And it. it it's um it's there there are trade-offs there there are trade-offs there um and i ended up making different decisions but um in part to deepen certain parts of my scholarship but i would still want to see people have the ability to be that type of public intellectual Mm. um and not just you know you have to reach like you're the full professor star you have the book deals kind of that's the model for it i think uh, the, the reality of the internet, it's the long tail of the internet is as important as the, the viral part. Um, mm-hmm. And you can't really control or predict what's going to be viral. Um, but but you have to be out there doing it. Right. Um, so you can create an audience and, and hopefully have some of those moments where you get more views than not. And then, yeah, like, you know, it all, it all takes time and it doesn't necessarily work the semester schedule or, um, that produce more academic papers type of thing. Um, and, but, um, but it is the people do it, you know, consistently say it's some of the most rewarding stuff that they, that they do. So let's take them at their word. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I've kept you for over an hour. Um, I don't know if there's like a last word that you want to sort of put out there. I also want to mention that you have uh, Anthro in the Everyday uh, Instagram page that you post on. Yeah, yeah. We'll see how I developed it. I, 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 I'm really intrigued by that project. Um, and I, I think I haven't settled on the format for what I wanted to do. Um, but again, it's something that takes time, and I want to. I think I get sometimes caught up exactly going back to this debate uh, It's supposed to be work I'm supposed to do and, and create content versus something where I want it to be fun mm. and engaging for me. So it doesn't feel like I have to go out and do it. Um, and I, I don't think I figured out the formula to that. And so, um, so I'm still trying to, f- yeah. And sen- that sense we're, we're trying to figure out what those kind of spaces will look like for us. So, um, 
uh, but yeah, I mean, I do all that media. I've been back on the blog a little bit, um, off Facebook. Uh, so, um, who knows what's going to be next podcast like you, a YouTube channel, something different, uh, just regular writing, which is a great media as well. So I don't really have a final word. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation with you, Will, and, um, and I'm glad you're doing this. Thanks. I appreciate it.